No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. I'm Desiree Shell. I'm the host of Skeptically Speaking, which is a Canadian radio show. And I'm going to assume you all heard that. Good. Uh, we have some lovely panelists today, and I will let them introduce themselves, starting with the end, Phil. My name is Richard Wiseman, just to get, <laughs> just to get that out of the way. Uh, I'm Phil Blade. I write the Bad Astronomy blog for Discover Magazine. And I'm wearing pants. <laughs> That's the best I can do. I am uh, Tim Farley. I'm a research fellow for the James Randi Educational Foundation, and I did their Today in Skeptic History app, so that's why I'm here. I'm Eugenie Scott. I'm the director of the National Center for Science Education, and I'm not wearing trousers. <laughs> oh, trousers, oh, how we're being of you. Okay. Uh, I'm Ben Radford. I'm neither uh, Phil nor Richard Wiseman, although we occasionally get uh, get those mixed up. I am the deputy editor for Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine, published by CSI, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, uh, and a uh, author of various books and investigations and other things like that. I'm Kylie Sturgis of the Token Skeptic Podcast. I write for the PSYCOP website for a column called Curiouser and Curiouser. My thesis is on the measurement of paranormal beliefs. I am a religious education teacher who married her dungeon master. <laughs> it's the best introduction ever. Good, I win. So let's start out by talking a bit about what skepticism is. Now, my impression is that scientific skepticism is different than philosophical skepticism, which is different from the skeptical community or the skeptical movement. So maybe we'll get that out of the way right now. What are your perspectives on that? Define those terms first. <laughs> are they all the same thing? Well, what do you mean by that? You, you sent an email and you said you said that in an email and I thought I'm not going to answer that question I'm going to put Desiree on the spot and say what do you mean by the difference between scientific and philosophical skepticism scientific skepticism to me is all about testable claims you look at a claim you find out how you can evaluate that using science or using evidence um, and philosophical skepticism is more about logic would that be correct Phil oh I don't know I'm a scientist, not a philosopher. Okay. <laughs> Damn it, Jim. So the first half, sure. Okay. Okay. Now, how about the skeptical movement? Because there's a lot of discussion around, uh, is, is skepticism the skeptical movement? Does anyone want to answer the question? What? What? They received without questions getting, like yeah, two weeks no, ago. Just without getting clear. in trouble? Is that what you mean? <laughs> um, well, of course. I mean, any any... Uh, any standpoint is different than the movement that then envelops it and uh, you can be a skeptic without being a part of the movement and I I would lay any amount of money you want, wish to name that you can be a part of the movement and not be a skeptic um, it, it's uh, they're not mutually inclusive or exclusive they overlap uh, but even then I mean it, it skepticism is a, whether it's philosophical or scientific I would I would say it's a tool and so that's very different than, than someone who uses that tool or misuses that tool. I would, I, I've never really thought of the, um, something called philosophical skepticism. That, that just isn't, uh, two words that never went together in my brain. <clears throat> but I think if I were to put those two together, um, to me this would be thinking of critical thinking, um, science, um, investigations of thing, and uh, so forth, um, as a way of life or personal philosophy. Um, and that, uh, those two would seem to be related, certainly. I mean, I, I would find it, if that is what we mean, of what one might mean by philosophical skepticism, it would seem to me that one would also be um, a practitioner or an embracer of the idea of skepticism. When I think of a skeptical movement, to me, that would movements to me are historical phenomena. 
uh, a skeptical movement to me would be um, the publications and individuals and uh, the followers of those individuals that originally began a um, began as a group analyzing claims of uh, the paranormal, uh, extraordinary claims in Carl Sagan's term. And uh, this, of course, was the original Psychop group in the mid-1970s, which then went on to um, expand into other uh, groups, butting off, so to speak, um, Randy Foundation, um, the uh, Skeptic Society, and of course the very many regional groups such as the Bay Area Skeptics, the um, New Mexicans for Science and Reason, the uh, New York City Skeptics, more recent groups, um, which have been inspired by this um, approach of questioning extraordinary claims. Um, that's what those terms would seem to mean to me. Okay. I'll, just, I'll just add that for, from my point of view, I'm, I'm far more interested in the, the practical applications of uh, scientific methodologies and skepticism to real world claims. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'm, I'm, can certainly talk about philosophical skepticism, but frankly I find it kind of boring. Um, <laughs> I, I mean you can talk to them, fine, whatever, I mean it's, there's, 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 I'm not saying anything bad about it, just that, that when, I, when I use skepticism and when I apply it, it's to specific claims that are being made in the real world, whether it's about Bigfoot or whether Obama's a Muslim or t what have you. And, and to me, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, and that's, that's my, main, my, my main interest. You're essentially, oh, is this working? You're essentially having uh, beliefs and conclusions that you are willing to be open-minded and test over, that you're um, making sure that they're reliable and valid and applying scientific method and methods of reason. And, these are being applied to empirical claims and even the claims of yourself. You have to even be making sure that you can even test your own assumptions in regards to scepticism. Philosophical scepticism historically has been more about um, ambiguity. Um, we had, uh, let me see, Pyrrho uh, was an ancient philosopher, for example, who was the originator of the notion of scepticism. And yeah, he extended out to the notion of doubting everything around him. And then we have Descartes who then takes it from there onwards. So it's, yeah, slightly more. Um, removed from the practicalities, as Ben said, of um, scientific scepticism and applying it in, in regards to empirical claims out there. Okay. Tim? Oh, that uh, philosophical. That one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That one. <laughs> well, I, I've always found it interesting that it, it does take a while to fully explain what we're after. Um, and as you saw, it took a lot of words there to get through what we were talking about for skepticism. And I've always looked for easier ways to talk about it. And I wrote a, a post recently about an elevator pitch. Basically, there's a thing you do in, in when you're trying to form a company, and you need to attract investors or purchasers for your product or whatever. And the idea is you are going to be riding an elevator with someone, so you have 30 seconds, a minute, to get your idea across. So what would the elevator pitch for skepticism be? And what I came up with, based on a lot of writing by other people, Daniel Loxton and, and others, was that it was the intersection, What for me anyway, the parts of skepticism that I'm interested in are the intersection between science education and consumer protection. So what does science say that can help us protect people from scams, uh, faulty products, uh, bad ideas, wastes of their tax money, those sorts of things. Now obviously there's a lot more to skepticism just teaching people critical thinking and stuff like that, but in terms of just getting the idea across to someone you've just met, I find that to be an, an easy way to get, kind of get a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what skepticism, what a lot of skepticism is about. Well, We, we need a gateway concept, right? Right. Something something easy, something comfortable that then hooks them and draws them in. And and something like that is, yeah, you know, you don't want to get screwed when you buy a dishwasher and you open right. it up and there are no parts in it. And so that's that's something when when somebody, when it hits somebody's pocketbook in a very basic way, uh, that's a great introduction to skepticism and then they can say, "Oh, but what about this and what about that?" And eventually, I think I think with a lot of us I, I, let me back off on that a little bit. I know that when I was in high school, there was an application of skepticism to things, uh, UFOs, for example, and, and, and like Ben would say, we would we would do the research, we'd investigate things, but then there was also a lot of bull sessions late at night where we're talking about, you know, what does it mean to know anything? Did was the universe created last Thursday? What about solipsism? This idea that you're the only thing in the universe, uh, and that's that's a that's a more philosophical aspect of it. I think you need both, but it's it you and you can do both at the same time, but to introduce 
you know, what is essentially a credulous public to something that they, they equate with cynicism is a difficult problem. And, and perhaps the fact that it's taking us all this time to even nail down what we're talking about might be part of it. Right. And that's, that's part of what the elevator pitch is about, is if you notice the two terms that I use, the intersection of science education and consumer protection, those are both positive ideas. Who could object to science education? It's a good thing, right? Consumer protection, also Congress. a good thing. <laughs> so the intersection of those two good things, one would hope, is also a good thing. Now I hope that uh, everything's clear as mud. That's what skepticism is. Um, <laughs> But one of the ways that, that I think we can talk about what skepticism is, is to look at the history of skepticism. So if, if you could just take turns sort of talking about some of the people and events that you personally found fascinating within skepticism. Start over here, Kylie. Um, historically, well, I'm, uh, you might have noticed I am an Australian, so within my own country, uh, probably one of the first most famous sceptics out there was a man called Dick Smith. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. In the 1980s, he was extremely popular. He started off electronics chain. He has done an amazing amount of... Um, uh, projects like uh, f he was the first solo helicopter flying around the planet I think it was he did a global helicopter flight he has done trans Tasman adventures I think I think he's done a number of adventures by balloon he's just one of those uh, amazing fellows who just says right I've got this idea I'm going to go do it and, and goes off and does adventures he started off a magazine called um, Australian Geographic and the store still exists for Australian Geographic selling science equipment very pro science guy started an electronics chain which still exists and is very popular Australia and he also was one of the first founding members of the Australian Skeptics and he put um, a significant amount of money I think it was about maybe $80,000 back in the 1980s which was huge um, I might be wrong but it was certainly a lot of money towards um, James Randi's uh, million dollar challenge and he's always been a big backer of uh, skepticism within Australia and, and helped promote skepticism the next person I would probably think of uh, is, is more current, even though Dick Smith is still around and was at a recent um, uh, Australian Skeptics meeting, is Dr. Karen Stolzno. And Dr. Karen Stolzno writes for Skeptics, she writes for Skeptical Inquirer, she does the Point of Inquiry podcast, she writes columns online, uh, she's on the Monster Talk podcast with Ben Radford, uh, she, is the, she has a PhD in linguistics, uh, she created the Pope Tart, which she tried selling on eBay with the um, example of Paradolia because the, this Pop-Tart looked like the Pope and uh, managed to get some press mileage for that as a skeptic, you know, putting on eBay in order to demonstrate that, yeah, people, it's just a tart, really, it's just a shape. And um, in terms of inspiration, she was uh, probably one of my earliest um, introductions to skepticism as someone who I could probably relate to more closely because um, as wonderful as Dick Smith was and as fabulous as all these electronic my first computer was in fact a, a Dick Smith wizard um, so I'm a bit biased there uh, Dick Smith is fantastic and certainly done a lot for skepticism but uh, Karen is probably more my contemporary and more of someone I, I, I very much admire now Tim had uh, a couple of interesting ones to talk about uh, you want me to focus on the people or the... Either. Either one? I, I personally am fascinated by skeptical history because there's there's so many things, especially as someone who's new uh, to the movement. I'm going to use the word movement. Um, as someone who's new, I, I really, I personally find it very valuable to, before I, I start doing activism within any kind of community, I want to know a lot about that community. So this is one of the ways that, that I find that, that I can prepare myself to do stuff like that. Yeah, I started doing this thing a couple of years ago where I, I find uh, daily facts, you know, this day in history sort of things, but that relates specifically to skepticism. And I started digging and, and, and no one had, there's some, you know, today in science history and stuff like that on the, on the web, but nobody had done it for skepticism. And then I started just posting them every day on Twitter and Facebook and various places you can do that sort of thing. And it, it sort of took off. People found an interest in it, and I found it interesting just digging to try to find something to go on every day. And, and one of the things I found that's kind of interesting is sort of the ebb and the flow of these things, that stuff comes back into favor and goes out of favor. And um, one is astrology. If you look at the history of astrology, there are times when it was very, very popular and times when it was less popular. And uh, there were points where, um, like when they discovered uh, Uranus and Neptune, uh, there were 
there was kind of an ebb a little bit in interest in astrology because part of the tenets of astrology prior to the discovery of the more modern planets was that there was a, 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 a magic or whatever, a numeral, numerological aspect to the number of things that were in the sky. There were, uh, you know, depending on whether you count the sun and the moon or whatnot, seven, six planets and whatnot. And then, you know, Uranus and Neptune messed that up. And then, of course, Pluto. And they've since adjusted to that, but that caused an ebb and a flow. But the one really interesting thing that I found is that, you know, we take for granted now that just about any newspaper in the United States and in England has horoscopes in it. And that can actually be dated to a specific event. Um, actually, about 81 years ago this week, it had to do with the birth of Princess Margaret in England. And uh, the Sunday Times in London was looking for feature stories to write about the birth of the new princess. And, of course, they were hungry to fill the paper with anything they could. And somebody came up with the idea of going and getting one of the famous astrologers to write a horoscope for the new princess. And they wrote a horoscope for the Sunday paper, and they got a huge reaction from the readers because they included not only the horoscope for the princess, but also the horoscope for if you're... Uh, you know, like you know, just like the normal horoscopes that you see these today, huge reaction to it. The paper put it in the next Sunday, and then started making it a regular feature. And pretty much within five or six years, every London paper had a horoscope column, and it spread from there. So you can blame Princess Margaret <laughs> for horoscopes being in every newspaper today. Phil, give me I a story. I think I'll do that. Blame I'll, her. I'll blame her. <laughs> Damn you, Margaret. Well, oh, she's, royalty. She's already dead, so. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, well, I just point to Jeannie. Um, as, I, as I didn't start uh, astrology. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, you started astrology. <laughs> well, I, I want but... to know if Bigfoot is Muslim. That's really what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm yeah. working on it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, maybe maybe what we could do is start our own uh, little conspiracy thing and, and say, you know, Yeti is circumcised and see see how far we can get with that. Someone um, tweet that. It's, it's, it's Yenti. Cut the fill bed. <laughs> yeah, okay. Come on, Yenti, that's funny. Um, oh, God, we're going to hear this as, forever and ever. Um, you know, important important moments in skeptical history, I'd point to Jeannie, who was, who was there at uh, uh, the Kitzmiller case in oh. Dover. You're, yeah, you remember that? Okay, oh, yeah. good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Um, I, I, I don't think I need to go into details there, um, but it's. I was going to start talking about doomsdays. That's what that's what we had discussed earlier, um, but actually Tim Tim made me think about it when I was uh, w when you're doing skeptical research. A lot of the time, these they're just ideas out there that are wrong. The kind of things you can look up on Snopes.com or, say, BadAstronomy.com. Um, but a lot of these, these things just go back into the misty past, and you have no idea where they started. And when you said that, uh, it, it, when you said the thing, you know, we can, we can trace this to a specific date, it reminded me um, of how much trouble I was having writing my first book because um, I wasn't actually, my, my editor was complaining, I wasn't actually writing a story, I was just sort of giving facts. And he said, you know, we're starting the first chapter about standing eggs on end. And that's, it's funny and it's fun and everything. But you're not telling the story. And I said, well, how the hell am I supposed to know when this myth started? And I started investigating it and I found out that Martin Gardner in Skeptical Inquirer had written about it and had traced it to uh, an article in Life magazine uh, to, a, to a reporter who had gone to China and they have a ritual where they stand eggs on end on, on what they call the first day of spring. And it's a fertility ritual because that's what spring is, right? There's all sorts of fertility rituals. Um, it was a photojournalistic uh, uh, sort of an essay. They had taken pictures of all these eggs standing on end. And that came out in 1948, I think it was, in like their June issue or something like that. Um, and boom, it started this, this idea that you can only stand eggs on it on the first day of spring, despite the fact that in China, in, in Peking, where, this, where the picture was taken, which is now Beijing, I believe, uh, they count the first day of spring being six weeks before what we do. And I, I'm not going to explain that. It, it makes sense. And as a matter of fact, I think in this country, as you, we, what we call the first day of a season is, is ridiculous. It's wrong. It should be six weeks off. But it's like it was so funny to actually find that. And say, look, if this had never been printed, 
I wouldn't have a career, right? <laughs> and it, it, to me, so that was it, pretty amazing to me. And when you said that, I hadn't thought about that in a couple of years. But I actually found that that issue, that art, that magazine. Finally, I've been searching for it for years and found it and read it. And it's like, how could anybody, how could anybody read this? which is just a, a cute little article about this, and turn it into this giant thing. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of this idea. It's actually been dying off in the past few years. But for a while, this was a big deal. You couldn't go uh, through the vernal equinox on, on March 21st without seeing an article in a newspaper, uh, news, mag uh, 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 news shows going to their local elementary schools with kids standing eggs on it. And, and it's, it's fantastic to be able to actually trace that. Um, I wouldn't have... I, going into this... I wouldn't have thought skeptical history would be that in engaging. I was going to say interesting. That's the wrong term. It's interesting, but I, I wouldn't have like like oh that's really cool. But in fact, oh that's really cool. Uh, and as far as doomsdays go, they come and they go, and there'll always be more. How's that? We I mean I'll be happy to talk about specific ones later, but I'll let other people talk. I think you just tagged Jeannie. Already true. Well, apropos our um, earlier discussion about. Um, skepticism being concerned with things that hurt people. Uh, this was something that came up this morning. Can you hear me okay? My voice has really gotten quite hoarse over the last couple of days. I don't know how that happened. Um, but uh, <clears throat> hopefully I, I'm coming across okay. Um, there are a lot of practices out there in the big wide world that really do hurt people. Uh, sometimes they even kill people. And to me, one of the great moments in skepticism was the early to mid-1980s James Randi investigation of faith healers. Now, whatever you think of faith healers, whatever your personal faith is, we're talking about people who exploit others. We're talking about people who make a great deal of money claiming to um, variously speak to God or have God speak to them or in some way receive divine, divinely inspired inf information on people's um, uh, illnesses and uh, very, sometimes very serious medical conditions. And uh, by exploiting these worries and concerns, we're all concerned about our um, life. Oh, hell, hang on. This was not supposed to happen. I think that oh, was coming next, from, next, from, oh, from the yeah, from next door <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, my, my screen was blank, so I was getting nervous about this already. Um, and, uh, you know, do, doing it using, quite frankly, um, very traditional magical techniques. Uh, cold readings and sometimes warm readings and sometimes uh, uh, just deliberate subterf subterfuge. And uh, people should know about this. Now, um, I'm going to play you a clip from a program that many people in this room have never seen before and maybe <laughs> not even have heard of before. And this was the very first or second incarnation of The Tonight Show with a, um, a host named uh, Johnny Carson, who himself was an, uh, was an amateur magician, knew James Randi from Magician Days, and had James Randi on his... Um, television program on The Tonight Show several times, always very engaging. You'll see a very much younger James Randi in this clip. Um, some of you have seen this clip before, but I'll just let Randi tell you the story, because this is worth a thousand words. Bob Long featured on his own program, you will apparently see a healing. Now we went to Houston, Texas, and we discovered that the man was wearing, of all things, a hearing aid in his left ear, and a man yeah, who heals the deaf, pop off himself. Oh, I see. And a man who heals the deaf and the blind isn't going to have much use for a hearing aid. One would think, if God is speaking to him, maybe someone else is speaking to him. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we got to San Francisco, we put uh, this fellow, Alec uh, Jason, as an, ex uh, an expert in electronics and a surveillance man, and he put a scanner, an electronic scanner on it, and we picked up something interesting. But first, let's look at the first cut of tape. All right, this is the tape, as you would see it if you were watching the show. Okay, watch the this monitors. This is Peter Popoff, a faith healer. Who is Harold? I just believe that God is going to burn those cataracts off of your eyes right now. Three, four, seven, eight, eight, Foothill Drive. I tell you, the angels of God are round about your home. Oh, just take those glasses off and put your eyes. If you've got cataracts, if 
you've got glaucoma, I want you just to put your hand over your eyes as I pray for these precious ones. Sister, you've got eye problems to take your glasses off, lay your hands on your eyes. Here it comes to God is going to give these precious ones divine surgery. Right now, right now, Jesus. That's it. That's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Praise God. I'll tell you the anointing is flowing through this place. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, now let's recap what we've seen here. These two people who were there had not met Papa That's before right. themselves. That's right. never spoken and yet he calls out his name and then he called out a number or something? He called out their address. Their address. And they're astonished to hear this because they really. didn't tell him. But what you don't know is that his wife has been touring around the audience getting into conversation. Is Jesus going to heal you today? I see. Where do you live? This kind of thing. And they've filled out healing cards in advance of the program and handed them in there. Now backstage and someone is sitting at a transmitter backstage. Let's see that same segment again. But now you will have the advantage of knowing what Peter Popoff is hearing in his left ear through a hearing aid. Jerry Reed. Is it Jerry? Reed. Reed. Is it Reed? Jerry Reed? It's a woman. She's praying for her husband, Harold. Who is Harold? He's got cataracts. I just believe that God is going to burn those cataracts off of your eyes right now. They live at 34788 Foothill Drive. 34788 Foothill Drive? I'll tell you, the angels of God are round about your home. Just take those glasses off and put your eyes. If you've got cataracts, she's got, a, she's got eye if problems too. You've got glaucoma. I want you just to put your hand over your eyes as I pray for these precious ones. Sister, you've got eye problems to take your glasses off. Lay your hands on your eyes. Here it comes to God is going to give these precious ones divine surgery. Right now, right now, Jesus. You know, that is, uh, that's disturbing when you see it. It is indeed. You tend to laugh at it, uh, and yet these people obviously are so impressed with what's going on. Oh, they're absolutely impressed. You see people collapse on the floor, tears running down their faces, believing that uh, their kids with drug addiction are going to be healed now because he knew their name. He says he's talking to God, that God speaks directly to him because he's an anointed minister. And one, three things amaze me about that. First of all, it turns out that God's frequency, I didn't know he used radio, yeah. is 39.170 megahertz. And God is a woman, obviously, and sounds exactly like Papa's wife, Elizabeth. <laughs> that was a, um, a brilliant uh, um, expose. Uh, as Randy goes on to say, Popoff didn't know he was being scanned, did not know that he would be exposed on the most popular late night television show, one of the most popular shows in the United States at the time. Within a year, Popoff declared bankruptcy. Now, you have to realize the amount of work that goes into something like this. Uh, Randy observed Popoff for, for many, many uh, healings, many, you know, followed him around the country, got suspicious because of the detail of the information Popoff was going into. This was sort of beyond your normal mnemonic memorization techniques. And um, as he mentioned at the beginning of this clip, uh, when Popoff went to do a healing in San Francisco, he engaged the help of the Bay Area skeptics and um, got a group of people to go in um, and got a man on the back of the balcony with a scanner and you know finding what, if there was something there and bingo they got it made all the recordings followed it up with other recordings and made sure that they got everything nice and clear and then exposed him on TV now this this had a huge effect on educating the public as to the kinds of uh, scams that go on in the name of faith um, it um, was disturbing to people who were believers and non-believers both, obviously. If you're a believer, you don't want to see something like this. Um, but, you know, Carson is absolutely correct. I mean, um, this, is, this is evil. Uh, th this results in people being seriously harmed. These faith healers will tell the um, sick people in the audience to throw your medications on the stage. Mm. And when later on... Uh, the investigators would would go through the trash at the um, 
auditoriums where these events would be held. And they'd look at the kind of medications people were throwing away. They were throwing away diabetes medications. They were throwing away heart medications. They were throwing away medications that were efficacious. And those people were very likely much, much worse off for having gone to this kind of a, uh, of a performance. And needless to say, the uh, people like Peter Popoff and W.V. Grant ended up getting lots and lots of money from these kinds of activities. Now, nothing is ever permanent. Um, one of my uh, board members at NCSE had a phrase a number of years ago that has stuck with us and which we refer to constantly. You are educating a parade. And maybe in 1986, 1987, people saw this kind of expose and they were shocked. And uh, people like Popoff and W.V. Grant were um, set back on their heels, had to declare bankruptcy. In the case of W.V. Grant, another very famous faith healer, he was actually thrown in prison for, um, for a tax evasion. Um, good, a good outcome, in my opinion. Um, nonetheless, both Popoff and W.V. Grant are back in business, they are both back on television and probably making a tidy income. Using, I don't know whether Popoff, I, Popoff is probably not using a monitor in his ear anymore, uh, but um, the kinds of mnemonic devices that allow you to memorize um, you know, information about somebody are fairly easy for anyone to learn. And these can be employed without any kind of mechanical uh, assistance. Um, we're educating a parade. Uh, the fact that people who do things like this that hurt other people are exposed once doesn't mean that they are exposed forever. Even some of the same people uh, can be back in business again after a period of time. So the job of the, um, of the skeptic who is concerned about these kinds of frauds that are being per perpetuated on the public needs to be recurrent. Uh, we cannot rest upon our earlier laurels, but this still was one of the, in my opinion, great moments in skepticism. Great. Thank you, James Randi. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually going to follow up on what, on what uh, Jeannie and Tim said. And one reason that I think that what Tim's doing is really important is that uh, to the degree to which skepticism is a movement, and you can certainly discuss that, movements need histories. If you're going to be part of something, you have to you have to be part of something that is a living entity, something that's going on that you can look back and say, "This is what we've done. These are things that have, that have happened." And that's one reason that it's important to have Tim sort of going back and saying, "Look, you know, this is this you know this sort of investigation didn't happen last week. It didn't happen, you know, at my last book." And same thing when Jeannie, when we see you know Randy doing this, this is this is this is this is part of of our traditions. And skeptical, inv skeptical investigation, like science, works on precedent. And the next time there's a faith healer uh, that, that someone comes up, it, it, you know, there will be others. This is, you know, I, I sometimes like to kid myself, oh, we, we took care of them. Yeah, there's, there's more coming up. There's more in the wings. There's the parade. There's, there's, the, there's the parade. And the, de the, de the degree to which we can point to these examples and say, if some journalist calls me up and say, you know, there's this faith healer, it's like, hey, I got something you should see. Check this out. Uh, maybe, maybe the techniques that they're using are, are the same ones as before. So, um, and that's 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 exactly why we need uh, to to get a history of these things. That's why it's important uh, to understand the history of our movement and investigations. To, to look at Randy's work, to look at uh, Joe Nichols' work, uh, Martin Gardner's work. And when mm. Phil looked up Martin's piece on eggs, I mean. It was right there. I mean, it's, it's, if you should have been a uh, subscriber to Skeptical Inquirer magazine, Phil. So you would have read it when it first came out. Yeah, it was like a, like a teenager. Whatever. I believe in Whatever. UFOs back then. Whatever. So, yeah. I, I also think that it's important to know um, one's own cultural history as well. Um, I come from a different country, and so knowing my own local heroes is just as important as knowing the American ones. For the UK people, it's important to know the UK ones. If I was in Europe, um, I know that there's a European convention for skeptics mm. and, and getting to know people there. And, and newcomers, I mean... Um, yeah, uh, one of the uh, projects that I know is in the works and what, something I'm very pleased that, that someone did a page for me is Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And so that enables us to have a, a straightforward database in order to see a variety of links and history that, that indeed is being built up over time and that there's, um, I'm not entirely certain how to pronounce her last name, but her name is Susan Gerbig. I think Ger it is. Gerbic, I think, yeah. Gerbic, yeah. yeah. She's an example of someone who's going out there and, and doing such a project and it's, it's an honour to be included in Skeptic History 
for my own part and hopefully more and more people will be added to that and more projects as we go over time because as you said the um Another phrase for it, the unsinkable rubber ducks right. out there that we just have to keep on battling. Well, I think you're just a quick follow-up. I think that your point about mm -hmm. the, the, the cultural part is important because mm -hmm. even, like, for example, one of my skeptical heroes is a man I was named after, Benjamin Franklin. Oh. And, uh, you know, founding father of our country. And he did an, an incredible uh, investigation in the 1770s into Anton Mesmer, a Frenchman who uh, had this, this uh, strange... Uh, theory about animal magnetism and the cures and this and that, and in 1784, Benjamin Franklin and others went over and investigated this, and they, they found it was complete bullshit, and they wrote a piece on it. And, you know, Benjamin Franklin was one of the original skeptical investigators, along with Houdini and others. So, uh, I like that example, because not only does it tie in with the skeptical movement's histories, it's, it's the American country's his, histories, you know, founded by skeptics. Yeah. I, Building on that, it, while I'm listening to, to everybody talk, some things go away. You know, I, I think you would have a hard time finding a paid phrenologist right now. <laughs> they yeah. might be out there, but I, I doubt it. Um, and, and there are all sorts of, you know, orgone therapy, is, I, I would assume, is gone. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you still see the yeah, orgone okay. stuff. A little it's bit, it's right? mostly a little just bit. in a Kate Bush song, and that's but, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and, and it, but, but some of these are gone. Some of them come back. Uh, pop off! Pop off is literally bad. Um, Nibiru, which which Planet X, which which died in 2003, is back, resurrected as a as a Mayan 2012 doomsday apocalyptic scenario. Uh, I, and I can't believe I'm getting email about Nibiru of all things. But it, you know, it's it's only been it's only been eight years and it's back. So these things come and go. Although uh, my friend Fraser Kane, who may be in the audience. May, uh, pointed out that this year we did not see the moon as or the Mars as big as the moon email. I noticed that. So I don't it, that that happens every August. So maybe maybe that one's dead. But, I you know. I do know that uh, there's a gentleman called Ken. I came from the New Zealand Skeptics um, Convention before I came to DragonCon. There's a gentleman called Ken Ring who is attributing earthquakes to moon cycles. Yeah, I, I know. So that, that it might guy. disappear He's, one way and then yeah. just appear in some other country. So knowing each other's links and history yeah. to help out other countries what is useful. What's that? It's even this going year? to Derek's oh, yeah. column. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, see, yeah. But I, I haven't actually seen it this year. That's interesting. But it, you know, it, as, as, you can't build a, a series on one thing. So I, I don't know if, if it's going to be gone next year or not. But I find it interesting that some things go away. Yeah. You know, the moon hoax is almost gone. I still get a yeah. few diehard people showing up at TAM, for example. Um, but also, I mean, I, I, I still see comments on, on a blog post I wrote two years ago or something about lunar reconnaissance orbit or a, a probe orbiting the moon taking pictures of the Apollo missions on the moon and people are still saying how fake they are. So it, it's fascinating to me that some of these things die and are gone. Some of them come back full strength and some of them are weak but there's still some people clinging to it. I mean, does anybody have any ideas about this? Why some go away and why some don't? Perhaps religious ones never go away because religion is always there. The basis for them is their faith. But some of these other ones, I don't know. I'm, ju I'm just yeah, asking. I mean, if, really if we don't know, we don't know. Sometimes so. a major proponent disappears from the scene. Like, uh, mm -hmm. wasn't uh, Jose Argelis the Nibiru guy? And uh, it was Nancy Leader and yeah. a bunch of other people. But sometimes, you know, they'll die. Called the personality, or, and they or, die. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it is an ebb and a flow, like the astrology thing I talked about, and and I, I get uh, frightened sometimes when I see younger skeptics, and sometimes you see it in the Q and A at events like this, and sometimes you see people just talking about it, about wouldn't won't it be great when we win? And, uh, Define and, win. Well, yes, I, I always say, no, 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 no. You're not thinking about it the right way. I mean, do you ever see a firefighter saying, won't it be great when we win the war on flammability? <laughs> no. There will always be firefighters, and there will always be a need for skeptics. Just consider it job security. Because we have <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> That's yeah, right. right. It's still there. And I guess in a broader um, sense, we're talking about psychology here. We're pattern-seeking creatures. We're going to be finding confirmation in, in randomness. We're, looking, we're seeking control. You know, and we have culture also influencing us. And so these are elements that are going to continue contributing to the, the issues that we face. And that's part of what it is to be human. We're going sure. to be rational and we're going to be irrational. It's, it's how we are. Sure, I agree. And I think... But I, I guess what I'm asking is, 
is, is there a meta-analysis that might be worth looking into here? Why do some of these die? Why do some of them persist? Why do some of them come back? If we could find a pattern to this, then there might be some, there might be, it'd be almost like medical forensics here. And well, say, you know what, when it's based on this, it tends to go away. So maybe we can, we can jump the gun and say, oh, look, we can, we can circumvent this, say all this stuff, this thing won't grow and doesn't become the next Heaven's yeah. Gate. My, pers my personal guess is that the, the, the sorts of topics that we're looking at are too idiosyncratic hmm. to really, I mean, feel free to do it. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that you know, if you're going to look at you know, the, the Bermuda Triangle, why, why was that big in the 70s and it's nearly dead now? Although I got a call from the BBC a couple months back wanting to ask me about it. I'm like, really? <laughs> you're digging up the triangle? Really? Futurama Slow had news a, day? Futurama had a Bermuda, Bermuda tetrahedron. Okay. Uh, that, that's yeah, got to go to The space Bermuda tetrahedron but, uh, but, episode but, recently. So. But I mean, that, that's the thing. And I guess, you know, I, I, so I think that, I mean, I think that you would find patterns in some things. Like, for example, you know, when Von Donner and dies, yeah. um, you know, uh, you know I, he's, he, all his books are still in print, and they still have all the all the errors that were in the original edition back in. Yeah. So you know, I mean, that that's going to live on. Um, I personally hope that the uh, that you know, twenty years from now, no one will really believe the chupacabra exists. But I don't don't really think that's going to happen. So mm. and, uh, Ben would be the excellent one to talk about um, the influence of the media in that regard. Is it so easy just to blame the media as helping perpetuate these things? I think there's a variety of factors out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. In, in order to have um, these events, you have to have followers. Mm. They have to appeal to people on some level. Mm -hmm. And I think Ben's probably right about the idiosyncrasies. There's so many levels that these various kinds of things can appeal to people. You know, mm -hmm. Wild men of the woods have been around for <laughs> centuries. Yeah, maybe, ghosts are maybe. not going away. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, uh, uh, did anyone else freak out on Torchwood when... Bloody Jack, uh, oh. Captain Jack t started talking. <laughs> he started talking about a particular pseudo scientific claim as being valid in regards to something that was going on, and I just started head desking like anything. And I thought, oh man, god damn it, Doctor Who, good science fiction helping promote these sorts of things. I was just a bit disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So what uh, I would like to tell you exactly what it was. <laughs> I wasn't particularly telling you exactly what it was, but yeah, it pops into pop culture, and then suddenly people hook onto it and think, "What? There's a tetrahedron in the um, Bermuda Triangle?" Oh, God. <laughs> so uh, now, being as uh, I'm probably the the newest one to the skeptical community at this table, um, what would you tell people like me who are interested in skeptical history? Where would you tell me to go to look for this? Uh, we need a history well, of skepticism. In fact, uh, the but, library. But but that's the right. thing. As a as a skeptic, um, I wouldn't necessarily have any idea of what to look up when I got there. Right. Is the Martin thing. Martin Gardner's facts and fallacies. Skeptics or fallacies. Joe, here's your yeah, yeah, yeah. next book. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Nichols here. Write that book. Because yeah. you yeah. knew all these people. You were involved in most of these, you know, in most of the recent last fun. 30 or yeah. 40 years of history. Mm. Um, yeah, and you write really well and fast. So we need Joe to write the book of the history true. of skepticism. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a great, a great resource. <laughs> We didn't know that up he, here. He, 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 didn't work, know, he didn't work with Ben Franklin. He didn't know Ben Franklin. <laughs> I just said the last 30 or 40 years, <laughs> which makes you my generation. But, you know, we've already had our relationship discussed already at this meeting, so we have to be careful yeah. about that. Uh, I had a uh, top 20 books that um, I did for a podcast episode, and I ended up turning it into a merchandise. It turned it into a T-shirt, so someone can walk into a bookstore and just look down at the shirt and say, do you have this one or that one yeah. or, or this one by Richard Wiseman? Because I thought, okay, well, what are my top 20 of someone? was going to go into a bookstore and find a good general book on, on a variety of things and, and I think yeah, that there's that more of a call out there to find yeah. some good Maybe decent books right. that people can say for book clubs and so forth. Well that, are there websites as well? Well that's why I recommended Fads and Fallacies yes, by Martin Gardner. List. It was yeah. written in the 50s mm -hmm. right and, and then it, now that I think about it it makes sense it ties into what I was saying earlier mm -hmm. a lot of the things he describes it's basically a description of a bunch of fads that and, and things that happen uh, dating back uh, decades before he wrote it and some of them are, you read it, it's, it's, they're gone. You know, I've never even heard of some of these things. Other ones, you realize, oh, you know, this is, this is Dianetics he's describing, which turns into the Church of Scientology. Uh, and, and other ones are, are, just cl are clearly still with us and going strong. So it's a beautiful, even though I don't think he intended it that way at the time, it shows us what things have disappeared and what's gone on. And it's a beautifully logical dissection of these things and showing why they may be fads or fallacies. 
It's a, it, so is it? You, you can always recommend books like Demon Hunt World. You can go yep. to the web and you can read uh, Tim Farley's uh, Twitter feed. Which which one is it? the K R E L N I K? Is that where you post the yeah. uh, daily? Okay, Daily Skeptic History. Daily Skeptic History. But I think uh, I think Fads and Fallacies might be a good one for a beginner yeah. because it really shows you. Yeah, some of the you know we can use logic all we want. Some of these things still come back because mm -hmm. they meet needs. Of some yeah, sort. a great and and if you happen to have an iPhone or a similar device, um, a compatible device, uh, there's an app that I mentioned that the JREF puts out. It's free today in Skeptic History. Just get it out of the iTunes Store, and it can pop up and tell you what happened on that day in history at, at your local 10 a.m. Instead of having to rely on me hitting you at 9 a.m., which might not be convenient in your time zone. But another great resource that they just uh, I blogged about because they radically dropped the price on it is the. Um, the archive disc, uh, the catalog disc, or wh whatever you call it, of Skeptical Inquirer. Um, it goes from uh, the original issues in 1976 mm -hmm. or 77 up until 2006. So there's hundreds of issues of Skeptical Inquirer, and it used to be 150 bucks, which would give you some pause uh, for buying it. That's a lot of money to shell out. It's now 25 bucks, and you get this DVD. You can load it all up on your computer. I've got it all on my computer, and I can just hit the search button on my computer and type any skeptical topic, and a bunch of issues will come up. And you can go right back to Joe's articles from from whenever, or Ben's articles, or whatever, and or Ben find, Franklin's. Excuse yeah, or Ben Franklin's. <laughs> And find that stuff that was written about uh, before, so that you're not reinventing the wheel. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will. I will second his plug for the uh, the back issues. Not because I get any any uh, any uh, you know cut of it, but uh, but no, really. I mean, it, it's uh, it's amazing how often I, I have both hard copy and, and on this and the DVD. And you wouldn't think just by skimming through something from 1984. You just randomly, but there's cool stuff in there. It's, it's oh, yeah. you, you would you, you're not going to find some dusty, archaic thing that's irrelevant. In fact, oftentimes you're reading something like, "My God, I read about this last week," and there's interesting perspectives, of course. And so, and the other example, another one that I would uh, recommend people look up is um, the Skeptics Dictionary by uh, yeah. Bob Carroll, which is yep. available both in hard on hardback and also on the website. And that's a good introductory place where. You know, it's and also James Randi wrote an encyclopedia of of, uh, of uh, claim. His, mm -hmm. He's got a, like a thirty-page title. I forgot what it. So the first part is the encyclopedia of, um, <laughs> and uh, the rest of it you can figure it out. I but, yeah, okay. But, okay. That, yeah, but I just that's those are those are a couple places where again it's not you know in your face you know hardcore hard to digest. It's here here's here's the thumbnail and then then go on from there. Mm. Uh, the young Australian skeptics were inspired by two volume um, uh, skeptics yeah. dictionary mm -hmm. skeptic dot com. It's and it has a variety of essays, and they ended up contacting bloggers and saying, "Okay, let's see if we can create a, a blog anthology." And, and that was something that they've done. Yeah. So let's take some questions from the audience at this point. <laughs> um, one uh, skeptic who I've, I, I, I really kind of admire, although I haven't really seen uh, much of him, uh, is Robert Lancaster, who has been the kind of the yappy little dog following Sylvia Brown for, for the last several years. If I could just clarify, he means convicted felon Sylvia Brown. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, and what I really admire about him is is just how just how simple and pure his data is. He just keeps score. He 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 ticks off the the uh, the testable claims and 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 it just just keeps track and. It doesn't really give them anything to attack, you know. Right. He, he just—that's uh, kind of how it should be done. He has a a poison control I could never possibly muster. But yeah. Um, <laughs> but I've I've always liked uh, Robert Lancaster and uh, Larry Kusha. We're talking about uh, talking about the Bermuda Triangle. Um, he went ahead and he did this exhaustive research into the history of the Bermuda Triangle. It, he went to libraries. He looked up, you know. He was following the the bibliographies back. I mean, he was doing wonderful, just basic historical scholarship. Uh, and he kind of, you know, he'd find things that had sunk in the Bermuda Triangle actually kind of disappeared in the Pacific Ocean. Whoops, <laughs> you know. And th so, um, yeah, he found essentially there was no there there. But those are the two that I will mention. Very good. Well said. 
Robert Lancaster's a great guy, and he does do great work. Yes, I agree. I wanted to toss out another resource. Um, Charles McKay's Extraordinary Popular Delusions and Madness oh, yes. of Crowds, 1841. So yes. this is not a... I mean, this is a conversation that's been going on for a while. And I, I do think that there probably is, in that 170-year history, trends that we probably can tease out and see why some things blow up and why some things fade away and others don't. I mean, creationism. We think of it as going back to the Scopes trial, right? But there's, there's, scopes, there's sort of stuff that tails off before the Scopes trial and then their stuff happens. But young earth creationism doesn't really take off until the 60s. And out of no, I mean, the, Henry Morris's The Genesis Flood, uh, out of nowhere, becomes this like multi-million selling book that no one would have, ex who, who would have predicted in 1961 that this book would have been this crazy thing. So understanding how, how something like that could go from being a relatively, relative non-entity within the creationist subculture to being the dominant thing that everyone, when you think of creationism today, it's young earth creationism. Until 50 years ago, that was not the case. How does that happen? And why hasn't it gone away? Because Baptists are much more popular than Seventh-day Adventists, which is where Morris got most of his information. But <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and duck now before I make my comment. Um, I watch a lot of TV. Um, I understand that there's a large portion of the U.S. that watches a lot of television. Really? What do we do in channels like the History Channel, Discovery Channel, uh, those kind of channels that you would think would have highbrow uh, stuff now have, you know, uh, stuff that should be designated on like the Sci-Fi Channel or something like that, you know, like your, your Ghost Hunters or, or something like that uh, that's all of a sudden started cropping up on like your history channels and, and discovery channels and stuff like that and I'll leave it at that. I, I would just suggest that, you know, writing letters to the the, the uh, channels isn't really going to help. I mean, you can you can write and complain about the pseudoscience, but ultimately they're going to go with what sells and if the producers think that it's going to sell. I think one way to do it is to support um, the, the shows that are good. Uh, I, think, I think Phil has a show. Mm. Not so much. Not so much. <laughs> Phil used to have a show that was quite good. Uh, you know, Mythbusters, uh, the Is It Real series that Joe and I and others were on, um, you know, for National Geographic. So there, there are good shows out there. Uh, they're, they're pretty rare. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, n nothing any of us can do is going to get rid of the, the, the shit on TV. Um, except, you know, just, you know, just pa patronize the good shows. And, and, and frankly, if you know people who are in the business, pitch shows to them. In, in fact, that's, that's, you know, that's an ongoing project. Is, is, you know, if you're not happy with what's out there, then put something else out there. And that's a positive rather than cynical thing to do. You're praising rather than being the naysayer saying, get it all in this show. Like, hey, this show is fantastic. Yeah. Actually, I'd just like to interject. Um, one thing you can also do is talk to your friends yeah. about the fact that that show is not evidence-based. Mm -hmm. That's it. Just continue to have those conversations. Even if people yeah. say you just spoiled all of Torchwood for me. <laughs> In fact, as long as those shows make money, they will continue to be made. Mm -hmm. So that that's the bottom line. I, I don't think that can be stopped. Um, so uh, unless you can swing public opinion to to the idea that you know Nostradamus, Hitler, black holes, ghosts aren't all able to be squished into one show on the History Channel, <laughs> Lots of people, right? You, that, that show's going to sell. And, and uh, so, so I agree 100% with what Ben said. Um, my, my more cynical uh, suggestion would be just wait for television networks to die. Um, that'll happen eventually, probably in the next 10 years or so. We'll see. But, uh, you know, trying to pitch your own content is very, very very difficult, and I could add a lot of varies to that. And, and thank you for, for suggesting that and, and for the compliment on the show. I don't think my show is going to get picked up. I haven't heard anything about it in a long time. So, uh, But it is really hard to get good skeptical content on TV because it's not a message people want to hear. They don't want to hear, we're wrong about this kind of stuff. You have to do it in a positive manner, which is what the Mythbusters does and why it's such a runaway hit. As Adam Savage has said many times at, at, at meetings, if they had set about to make a skeptical show, or a show about science, they would have failed miserably. But instead, what they do is they're sneaky about it, and the show's a runaway hit, and how many kids have, are learning about how to test things and probably blowing their fingers off um, <laughs> because of that show. It's awesome. 
just just real quick, one of the one way that you can combine two of those suggestions, pitching your own show and helping the networks die, is go do something on YouTube. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff. There's a flyer for NSFW right here. There's a lot of streaming media right now that's getting very very uh, exciting and and becoming the place that people go to watch, particularly younger people. And uh, so you can be you know the content provider. Uh, for the future, and there's a lot of people doing that now. We put all our Atlanta Skeptics uh, panels uh, from Skeptic Camp up on Vimeo, and you know, put your own stuff up there. Figure out something that somebody else isn't doing, maybe an investigation or whatever, and do your own show yeah. um, and try to be creative. I do p uh, podcasts and vodcasts. One has come up already uh, today about my ventures at the Atlanta Skeptic Star Party, featuring yeah. <laughs> featuring Phil Plate. So yeah, yeah, get the content out there. Um, my question has to do with the faith healing that you guys talked about. As a nursing student, something that we really harp on is um, educating patients on the pharmacotherapeutics and how it actually works and, sh you know, stressing the importance of adherence to medication and really educating them on how it works, why it works, and why you should stick with it. So as far as the faith healing goes, do you guys feel like there's a failure on the medical field to educate their patients as the necessity I mean if people are throwing their diabetics medication on the stage clearly they're not they don't understand the importance of their medication so do you feel like there is a failure to completely educate their patients I, I don't don't beat yourself up too much really um, <clears throat> people will um, people want to hope mm. and faith healing gives them hope um, a lot of the people who go to be healed um, to these, and I was involved in some of these um, investigations as part of the Bay Area Skeptics back in the um, back in the 80s, um, and and it, it breaks your heart to go go to these healings because the people who go there are very desperate and they so very very much want to be better, and you see the people who show up with their their crippled kids in wheelchairs, and you know these kids aren't going to walk ever again. I mean, they're just twisted bodies. Um, or people come up with grandma in a wheelchair, and she's you know very pale, and she is thin legs, and she you know that grandma's never going to you know. It's very unlikely that that anything good is going to happen to her. And uh, but people still have hope. They want to help their loved ones. Um, that hope is going to, in many cases override whatever knowledge that they have, whatever rational understanding they have that you and your colleagues have imparted. And, and don't give up. Keep doing that because that's incredibly important. But don't expect that people aren't going to grasp at straws. I think it's important to try to help people understand that there are people out there who are, that, that are preying on their, um, uh, on their miseries and on their, uh, their, their hope and that they should not countenance this, they should reject this. Um, but everyone wants hope and, and you, you don't want to destroy hope. You just want to have them direct their hope to a, an end that is going to be more useful to them. And certainly, this sort even even the brief amount that you saw in this uh, clip on the Today Show or the Tonight Show, I think probably helped illustrate to you what you know what a um, the desperation of the people who go to these things. It's, it it does really break your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Again, mine's a, more of a comment uh, rather than a question. Tim, you brought up astrology, and, and when I came home from Vietnam in 1969, age of Aquarius, and uh, there was a when I was <laughs> when when I was a student, they had <laughs> when I was a student, they had a, a big thing on astrology, and there was some newspaper somewhere that ran the same astrology <laughs> one week for you know. One Monday it was the same thing for the Monday before, the same thing the Monday before, Tuesday the before, and it went for four months before somebody finally wrote to the newspaper and said, "You are writing the same thing every day," and so it's still out there. You know, no matter how you educated you get people, there are still people that will still continue to to follow that along. That's yeah. awesome. That's great. Thank you for that. All right. And that's all the time we have. Thanks very much to everyone for coming. Thank you.